This is the notes for section 10.5, Relationships Among Sines and Cosines. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you uh, pause the video at this time and read the section before continuing on to do, to do these notes. Um, so in section 10.4, we establish the fact that, that if we're looking at sine and cosine, theta can be any value at all. It doesn't have to be just a value between 0 and 90 degrees. So we've now, we've kind of opened up that angle to say, hey, any rotation of the point 1, 0 uh, can be a value for theta. So what we have to do is we have to think about, well, what is the value of, of sine or cosine based on the quadrant that it's going to be in um, uh, as, as I look at that unit circle? We know that um, when, I, when I do that, that the, the x value is going to be the cosine of theta, and the y value is going to be the sine of theta. And I know any rotation between 0 and 90 degrees is in quadrant 1. Um, 0 and 108, or 90 and 180 degrees would be in quadrant 2. 180 and 270 would be in quadrant 3. And finally, 270 and 360 would be in, in quadrant 4. Um, and then over here in the second piece here, I, I, I have kind of the, the values, if you think about your x and y, in the first quadrant, both x and y are positive values. So any rotation in that first quadrant is going to give me a, a positive cosine value and a positive sine value. Okay? In the second quadrant, we know that cosine is negative. Okay, because our x value would be negative, and we know that sine is positive because our y value would be positive there. The third quadrant, they would be both negative. And finally, in the fourth quadrant, the cosine would be positive, but the sine would be negative. So one of the things that we have to, to consider as, as we're looking at the sine and the cosine of theta is we have to consider what would be the sine of that value. And by, by thinking about your quadrants in terms of what the x and y values would be in each of those in each of those quadrants would determine what the sine and cosine values would be in each one of those quadrants. Now I have a unit circle here and we can kind of see this happening if I'm moving this point around my circle as I'm in that first quadrant you'll notice that both cosine and sine my x and y values are, are positive. As I get into the second quadrant, you'll notice how my, um, my cosine value is negative and my sine is positive. Get down into my third quadrant here, and they're both negative. And then finally, in my fourth quadrant over here, we have the x value or the cosine is positive, whereas the sine would have to be negative in that quadrant. All right, one of the uh, terms that we'll be using quite a bit with trigonometry is the, the term identities. Uh, there, there are quite a few trig identities, and we'll, we'll explore a few here in this course, but quite a few more you'll, you'll explore in, in some of your later courses uh, as, you, as you get closer to your calculus course. Um, but, but when we talk about an identity, it's just a relationship, uh, relationships that are true for all values of a variable of the variables in a domain so whatever the domain is it's got to be tr true for all of those so if we're talking about the sine and the cosine of theta and theta has a domain of all real numbers it's got to be true for all real numbers well the first trig identity that we're going to look at is the Pythagorean identity theorem and it says the following for all theta so in other words all values of theta that are true for cosine and sine which is all real numbers the cosine of theta squared plus the sine of squared, theta squared is equal to 1. Or we also can write it in the following manner. The cosine squared theta plus the sine squared theta equals 1. And you'll see me write it this way a little bit more often than this. It's, it's just a little bit more mathematically acceptable. So just kind of keep that in mind. But either one of them is, is fine to write it like that. Okay, so that's the Pythagorean identity. And if you think about it, when we established what the cosine of theta and what the sine of theta were, remember they were legs of a right triangle. And we know the hypotenuse of that right triangle is um, is one because it's, we're talking about a unit circle. Okay, so because of that, we we know from Pythagorean's theorem that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So really, all, all we're doing is using Pythagorean's theorem to, to work with the Pythagorean identity. Mm -hmm.
All right, at this time, uh, you might want to uh, take a minute or two to read example one on page 6088 in your book. It's very similar to this example problem that I'm going to go over. I'll just kind of refresh your memory as to how, how they did that, and then we can, if you want to, then uh, just start the video again, and I'll go through example one here. All right, so example one says in the diagram, for example one, suppose that the angle formed by the segment and the positive x-axis is 52 degrees. So this is the angle right over here, 52 degrees that we're looking at. Okay, And it says approximate the value of c, or the coordinates of c, excuse me, to the nearest thousandth. Well, I know that c, since it's on the unit circle and is a rotation of the point one zero, I know that the value of it in relation to its rotation is the cosine of theta. Well, in this case, that rotation would have to be that 52 degrees. And then the sine of theta, which in this case, once again, is a rotation of 52 degrees. So to find my coordinate there, all I have to do is plug into my calculator what the cosine of 52 and what the sine of 52 would be. So let's do that. Now remember when you enter those on your calculator, you need to enter them in such a way that you hit control enter so you get a decimal approximation. So if you look at that, we, we would have for it to the nearest thousands, remember that's three digits after the decimal point, so that would be 0.616 for this for the cosine and 0.788 for the sine. Okay, so we've we've now uh, approximated those to the nearest thousands. Now part B is probably the, the more of the new stuff and that is now we want to verify that part A satisfies the Pythagorean identity. So let's look at doing that. If that's the case then if if I take and I and I square both of those so basically we're saying the cosine of 52 degrees squared plus the sine of 52 degrees squared has to be equal to 1. Okay? Or in this case, approximately 0.616 squared plus 0.788 squared equals 1. So let's look at that on our calculator now. Now when I enter that using my approximations, you'll notice that I actually get 1.0004. And the reason why it's a little bit off is because, once again, we did an approximation when we came up with those values. Now if I use my exact values for that, you'll notice that it comes out to be exactly 1. So the Pythagorean identity does work as we look at this particular example. So we'll say that that does check out for part B. Okay, before doing number two here, you might want to take a look at uh, examples two and three in, on page 689 in your book. Um, they kind of illustrate kind of what I'm going to be covering here in numbers two and three on the notes here as well. Um, so in, in number two, it says, show why the cosine of 252 is equal to the opposite of the cosine of 72. Okay, well... If I think about this, if I'm if I'm talking about the cosine of 252, what I'm really saying is that the cosine, remember, is your x value. So when I rotate the point 10, 252 degrees, I end up right here with an x value of the cosine of 252. Now, if I think about the right triangle that that makes with the x-axis, okay, this x value is going to be exactly the same as this x value. And the reason why we know that is if I take 252 and I subtract 180 degrees so I can figure out what the first quadrant equivalent to that would be. So I'm just subtracting 180 degrees from this. You'll notice that I get 72 degrees. So the first quadrant equivalent of the cosine of 252 is the cosine of 72. But the the only other thing, so why isn't the cosine of 252 equal to just the cosine of 72? And the reason for that is I know in the third quadrant that both my x value and my y value are negative numbers. Therefore, up here the cosine 
and the sine are both positive values. So the only way that, that the cosine of 252 and the co cosine of 72, the only difference is their sine. So we can take care of that by making it negative. So that's why the cosine of 252 is equal to the opposite of the cosine of 72. Okay? So anytime we're looking for a, um, a cosine of, or a sine of a value that's not in the first quadrant, we can always find its first quadrant equivalent by looking at what is the angle that that um, rotation would make with the x-axis. So if I look at this angle right here with the x-axis, that value is 72 degrees. Okay, Exactly the same as this first quadrant value of 72 degrees. And then the only other decision we need to make is, is it positive or it's, is it negative? And we can make that determination based on what quadrant um, that, that rotation would end up in. <laughs>